and Deputy Adams rightly refers to 180,000 mortgages currently. I, I, I think we're going to see that figure perhaps exceed the 200,000 mark by the time your personal insolvency agency is up and running. And I'm just wondering, in terms of the work programme for the agency, uh, you know, what you envisage in terms of its capacity to deal with such a vast number uh, of cases uh, that, that will face it. And uh, Count Corla, with, with your permission, if I could refer also to the, the impact of the home tax, the property tax, on the buy-to-let sector. Uh, the buy-to-let sector are now in considerable difficulties. We have 100,000 people as I understand it, on local authority waiting lists. The central bank has described uh, the pillar banks as being in, continuing to be in denial. Now, what in your view is the impact of a situation wherein, as a result of your budget, additional burdens will be placed on those who have uh, buy-to-let properties that are in negative equity, that are at risk of repossession, they're, they're going to carry the burden now of the uh, property tax. And there are implications when you uh, parallel that with the work being done by Minister uh, Burton, who we could say in a general sense uh, has, has um, uh, some mandate to do something about the half a billion a year that's been spent on rent subsidy. But if on the one hand government is driving down rent subsidy, and on the other hand, they're increasing uh, the, the cost burden on those who are in arrears in the rent, uh, in, in the buy to rent market. Uh, we're storing up additional problems for us. What will happen to the tenants of the buy to let uh, individuals? Many of them very ordinary I'm afraid people. Restraining a little bit here. It's, it's well, perhaps so, but maybe the Taoiseach will give me a little bit of flexibility and maybe address the particular issue. I, mean, I, give I, you a bit of flexibility. I think there should be an opportunity for, uh, for a broader discussion in the new year with this Deputy Affairs, with the Minister of State for Housing, Minister Sullivan, Minister for the Environment, uh, Minister for Finance. Uh, clearly, I'd like to see a situation where the banks. Who, well, and, and nobody has been standing up for, for, for banks, nor do I indeed, but they, they have changed uh, their attitude here. Uh, and I understand that they have now trained personnel to be able to go and talk directly to uh, you know, people who have um, mortgage distress or in, uh, are in arrears with their mortgage. And quite a number have been restructured. And that's, that, that's to be welcomed, obviously. But the insolvency ag agency support and, uh, through the insolvency bill will provide an alternative uh, method of dealing with, uh, with um, serious debt uh, for people as well. And banks know that. And obviously, they, they would be, uh, they'd be far better from their own perspective to be able to work out a solution for people who have distress or mortgage arrears uh, in whatever category. Um, and I hope, that, I hope that the words that I hear uh, will actually be seen to be implemented because this is, this is of enormous um, importance and pressure on people every day. Uh, I can't actually give you the, uh, the work uh, schedule, Deputy Farrell, of the insolvency director who is in situ with staff to back him up. I'm sure we can supply you with their tentative proposals or whatever uh, that would be in, in everybody's interest. And I, I'd like to see a situation here where either at Rothers committee level or here in the House uh, in the spring, we're going to have the opportunity uh, to discuss the ongoing work uh, of the insolvency agency when it's actually set up to see how effective it can be. As, is, as, as you know, this was, a, this was a, from drafting to conclusion this week, was a very uh, complex and technical bill. Uh, but I hope that between all of these measures uh, and the, the projected growth in the economy, that the situation for people with mortgages, particularly those who are in, in, uh, in, in arrears or in distress, uh, will improve. Deputy Higgins. Margaret Kian Corley. Um, Tishuk, I wonder if you could explain to the Dáil how the Economic Management Council uh, functions as a subcommittee of the Cabinet. And is it the case that virtually the entire budget uh, that was announced for 2013 
was decided there by four members of cabinet and only announced to the full cabinet at the last minute. Um, is it the case that the Economic Management Council has acted in a really secret and authoritarian uh, fashion? Um, from what we've heard, that we could compare it to a kind of Stalinist Politburo, concentrating huge power in a few hands uh, and operating in great secrecy. And how does that equate to the democratic revolution that you, pl you promised uh, at the beginning of this uh, doll? And is it the case really that because there is a coalition <laughs> government that this council and its operations is a preservation mechanism for the leadership of the two parties, Fine Gael and Labour? Essentially, you treat your backbenchers like tunnel mushrooms, you keep them in the dark on key issues, dump the uh, austerity decisions uh, that have great public distaste upon them and then simply pick them to come in and vote for you. Um, so wh where does this modus operandi come from? Uh, and wh what justifies it? And lastly, Tisha in Concordia, your glowing tribute right now, Tisha, to homeowners who regard their homes, pay mortgages and upkeep, etc. Um, you have always held that position. But in 1994, you felt that a home tax or a property tax was a vampire tax that would drive through a stake, a stake through the heart of that home ownership and suck the lifeblood of people who want to own their home and better their condition. What's changed your mind about that? Tishak? Um, the, let, me, let me assure you, Deputy Higgins, that the, the um, last year, uh, for the preparation for the budget for 2011, as soon as the Dáil came back in September, the end of that month, early October, you had a rash of speculation every week about what was going to be cut in the budget, which certainly had a direct impact upon um, consumer confidence and the retail area. Because people, uh, people quite rightly said, well, what is going to happen? I don't know what's going to happen, so hold tight. Now, the budget this year was discussed and approved collectively by the Cabinet. That's a requirement that it be signed off. The preparation for that wasn't just conducted by the Economic Management Council. There were individual face-to-face -face meetings and bilateral meetings between the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform and each and every minister about the ceiling for their department, about their proposals to reach savings or whatever in respect of their department and their responsibilities. And they were all signed off on in regard to, um, in regard to that by at bilateral level. It came through the Economic Man Management Council and then on to, on, on to government. And this year, there wasn't the same level of either um, of either public um, you know, comment, uh, except I did notice that there were wild speculations that the, you know, the old age pension was going to be cut, the free travel was going to be taken away, the free light was going to be taken away, the, the, the period for free fuel was going to be shortened, that the allowance was going to be taken away, that the carers' allowance was going to be cut, that the home care packages were going to be cut, all of these things. Uh, and then there were extraordinary remarks about the scale of property taxes which would run to uh, thousands. You had the same speculation when you had the comment about the requirement uh, to uh, deal with pollution from uh, septic tanks in different parts of the country of the extraordinary amounts that this was going to cost. Uh, but these things uh, obviously were very different in reality. Um, uh, obviously, 1994 is a, is a good bit back, Deputy. Um, in a very different space, we've had uh, the obscenity of, uh, of uh, a couple of governments in between, um, you know, shoveling out mountains of money that didn't belong uh, to us here and that somebody was going to have to pay back for. Um, and in that sense, um, in that sense, uh, we've had to uh, focus on how you rectify this problem. Believe you me, it's not easy. Uh, but in the last 15 months, things have begun to turn towards the right direction. Still serious challenges facing our people. And uh, as I said earlier on, the assistance 
of our European colleagues is something that we need. So it's not a case, Deputy Higgins, of a quartet deciding on every, every element of the budget here. All of the bilaterals took place. Ministers agreed uh, on votes and figures uh, for their respective departments. And then that was um, discussed uh, collectively and signed off collectively and approved collectively by the Cabinet, as is their, as is their responsibility. So a minister, minister for whatever department wouldn't you know, be aware of the detailed discussions about another minister's department until such time as Cabinet will come together collectively on that. Deputy Boyle back. Thanks, uh, Ken Corley. Taoiseach, in relation to the Cabinet Subcommittee on uh, Mortgage Arrears, um, can I ask, uh, did this committee uh, meet with the Troika and uh, discuss their demand that legislative impediments to banks repossessing family homes uh, should be a priority for the government because I, uh, it's difficult to tally your soothing words about the low level of repossessions in the country and your assurances that personal insolvency are going to uh, protect uh, homeowners from the loss of their family homes with the simultaneous demand by the Troika uh, that legal impediments to the right of banks to repossess family homes uh, should be uh, a priority. So uh, did, you, did this committee discuss that with them uh, and could they explain their rationale in making this uh, demand? And is it not the case that consequently, given this demand, uh, that uh, uh, people with mortgages and particularly people with distressed mortgages uh, should be very fearful uh, because our Troika masters are demanding that banks should be able to repossess uh, more homes. Uh, and on the uh, Economic uh, Management uh, Council, uh, Taoiseach, it is very, very clear that uh, the um, protections in terms of low corporate tax rate and uh, a refusal to impose the financial transaction tax uh, were uh, uh, that the submissions of the banks, of groups like the Clearinghouse Group and so on, were listened to by your Economic Management Council. Uh, and it, it's equally obvious, uh, is it not Taoiseach, that the Economic Management Council did not listen to the plethora of civil society groups, of groups dealing with uh, poverty, like St. Vincent de Paul, like Social Justice Ireland, like the trade unions and so on, who were representing the least well-off in our society, the struggling uh, sections of our society, who made submission after submission, asking that the burden of austerity in the budget should not fall on those who are already struggling uh, to survive. So isn't it the case that this Economic Management Council, the inner cabal of the government, uh, only listened to one section of society, the Troika, the banks, the very wealthy, and simply refused to listen to and ignored uh, the civil society and other group, uh, groups, uh, organisations that represented ordinary uh, citizens, low and middle income people, the unemployed, uh, the vulnerable in our society. And isn't there something radically wrong, therefore, with the way this inner cabal of uh, the government uh, is uh, deporting itself, only listening to one minority section of our society and not listening at all uh, to the voices of the majority? Uh, no marks for that. The Economic Management Council did not meet with the Troika. The Minister for Finance and the Minister for Public Expenditure and Reform met regularly with the Troika in regard to the Memorandum of Understanding, in regard to the, uh, to the fulfilling of the conditions of the bailout programme. But the Troika did not meet with the Economic Management Council. Um, the, the question of, um, of the Troika uh, putting forward their view that legal clarification was required in regard to the consequences of the Dunn case dealing with mortgages is something that had to be dealt with and that legal clarification uh, will be provided uh, following the setting up of the uh, insolvency, uh, insolvency uh, service uh, and that's not uh, to be taken as any indication of a rash of, um, 
of how street possessions. I've already made the case to Deputy O'Farrell and Deputy Adams about that. I've answered you previously about the financial transaction tax. Uh, we have objected to the financial transaction tax. We have not participated in the enhanced cooperation at European level for the financial transaction tax. Ireland, as you know, imposes a stamp duty on transactions. And clearly, Deputy Boyd Barrett, we didn't want to place our own International Financial Services Centre at a disadvantage to London if none applied there. And there were reports from the Commission in their own documents about the financial transaction tax, but I don't speak for other countries in this regard. And now that 11 of them have signed on for enhanced cooperation with, uh, with uh, the regard to introducing a financial transaction tax, Ireland, as the incoming presidency of the Council and the Union, will not um, impede that, though we need to know the conditions that apply to it, of course. And in regard to the low corporate tax rate, this has been uh, something that has been an important element of investment in the country here over very many years. 12.5%, 11.9% effective across the entire board. As Deputy Boyd Barrett is aware, in some of the other countries in Europe, different rates of corporate tax apply for different sectors and indeed in different regions. But in Ireland, it's very straightforward, uh, very transparent, uh, and was, uh, it was and is an important element uh, of attractiveness of the country here for investment. And we won't be, uh, we won't be changing, we won't be changing that. So there are the answers to your questions. Thank you. That completes uh, questions to on feature for today. The next item is um, the order of business. All right, when you're ready. Yes, sir. The, the order of business should be as follows. Number 11, motion regarding proposed approval by the all of the Horse and Greyhound Racing Fund Regulation 2012 back from committee. Number 12, finance local property tax bill 2012 financial resolution. Number 26, finance local property tax bill 2012 order for committee, committee in remaining stages. It is proposed, notwithstanding anything in standing orders at 1, the Dáil shall sit later than 9 p.m. tonight and shall adjourn not later than 11 p.m. Number 2, numbers 11 and 12 shall be decided without debate. Number 3, in the event a division is in progress at the time fixed for taking private members' business, which shall be number 93, motion regarding carers. Standing order 121, subsection 3 shall not apply, and private members' business shall, if not previously concluded, adjourn after 90 minutes. Four, the committee in remaining stages of number 26 will be taken today, and the proceedings thereon shall, if not previously concluded, be brought to a conclusion at 11 p.m. tonight by one question, which shall be put from the chair, and which shall, in relation to amendments, include only those set down or accepted by the Minister for Finance. Thank you. There are four proposals to be put to the House. And number one is the proposal that the Dáil shall sit later than 9 p.m. tonight and shall adjourn not later than 11 p.m. agreed to. Is that agreed? Uh, number two is the proposal for dealing with items, uh, item numbers 11 and 12, motionally proposed approval by Dáil Aaron of the Horse and Greyhound Racing Fund Regulations 2012, back from committee, and financial resolution refinance Local Property Tax Bill 2012 without debate agreed to. Is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, is the proposal for dealing with private members' business agreed to? Agreed. That agreed? And finally, um, is the proposal for dealing with item number 26, Committee and Remaining Stages of the Finance Local Property Tax Bill 2012 agreed to? agreed. Not agreed. Uh, call Deputy O'Farrell. I suppose we, we've, ha we've had some of this, this discourse earlier uh, this afternoon, but Ciancorla, I must on behalf of my party uh, object uh, strenuously to this rabbing through of this vital piece of legislation. From time to time the guillotine will be applied and we will accept, though may, we may protest, that there is an urgency to the moving of the legislation. But this is a piece of legislation which will, in its current form, place enormous burdens on Middle Ireland, people who are already carrying a weight that is, in many ways, excessive. There is no need, Taoiseach, for this piece of legislation to be forced through in this way. We could, for example, have come in here yesterday 
uh, when I, I believe the business of the House uh, was concluded in advance of time. We could have come in here and debated it yesterday, but that opportunity uh, was not given to us. We can come back here after the Christmas break and debate this and go through the 88 amendments uh, that the public have a right to expect that we will debate in a serious and conscientious manner and tease through this legislation in the way that we as legislators are obliged to do. Yeah, yeah. Now, Taoiseach, I put it to you earlier. I put it to you earlier, Taoiseach, that you committed okay. yourself and your government to political reform. We are now seeing the political reform. The reform is that we now have a budget that was decided on by four members of the Cabinet, and we now have the outcome of that budget being decided in this House on foot of guillotines, which doesn't even allow your own backbench deputies an opportunity to, con to contribute. So, again, I, I must say, Taoiseach, uh, I, I respect you, but I do not respect the manner in which you have broken your promises on the pe uh, to the people of Ireland on this matter of yeah, political yeah. reform like and the this. manner in which you're using your, pre your unprecedented, your unprecedented uh, majority to jackboot through this type of legislation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, I also want on behalf of Sinn Féin to oppose Proposal 4. The, uh, the number of people, and we discussed this as, as uh, Dr. O'Farrell has said earlier on, one in four mortgage holders are in mortgage distress. Hundreds of thousands of families are struggling to get by. And yet this odious tax is going to be press gang through this uh, doll. You're going to impose a family home tax on every single family home in this state. Now, why, why can't we don't have a property tax in the north, my dear friend? But why, do, why don't we have the opportunity here to discuss this out? What's the government afraid of? You know, you chided Fianna Fáil because at a previous budget. They roasted it through before even the weekend, obviously as part of their party management. You're doing exactly the same thing. Why, why can't people here who have a position, who have a mandate, who have proposals, who want to argue, why don't we have the opportunity to do that? So, Taoiseach, all the talk and you know, every single session we have in here, yet another uh, promise in the programme for government bites the dust. And we saw that again earlier on. Uh, today. Why can't there be a full debate? This, this isn't going to come in until next summer. So why, why can't we have this discussed out in some detail? Deputy Boyd Barrett. Thanks, Ken Corla. Uh, Taoiseach, uh, th this extremely cynical uh, and undemocratic attempt to ram through the property tax is not going to save you the popular revolt uh, that you hope it will next year when people have this unfair tax imposed on them and when the level of popular resistance and boycott that we saw in the household charge uh, will be far greater even and far more terrifying for your government uh, than the boycott was uh, last year. Uh, but despite uh, the, that forlorn effort on your part to try and uh, forestall protest, nonetheless Taoiseach, uh, this is a cynical exercise in the extreme. There's 159 sections in the property tax bill. By anybody's standards, this is one of the most important pieces of legislation this government will ever put through. It is one that will affect virtually every citizen in the uh, country. Uh, there are a hell of a lot of details involved in the new powers that it gives to revenue, uh, to seize money at source from ordinary workers and for social welfare uh, recipients. It is going to have huge economic implications in terms of the burden it will impose on low and middle income families and a potentially extremely damaging effect it will have on the domestic economy and many, many more details and complexities and potential anomalies to say the very least. And you intend to forestall all of that debate and uh, have those 159 sections squashed into a couple of hours. Of those 159 sections, Taoiseach, we'd be lucky if we get through seven or eight. Now, that makes a farce and a sham of democracy, of this House, of its role uh, in terms of legislative scrutiny. It is absolutely cynical and dictatorial in the extreme. Lift the guillotine, 
allow at least for a debate on this, allow for all amendments uh, to be discussed. It can easily be done early next year because it doesn't come into force uh, until the middle of next year. There's simply no excuse for this Taoiseach. Thank you, Taoiseach. We're, we're wasting time here. Deputy O'Farrell has spoken about jackboot tactics. Um, <laughs> Deputy Adams has spoken about uh, family homes. Um, obviously, everybody, uh, everybody will contribute uh, in some shape or other to the uh, property tax here. And I'd remind those um, that thank the majority of people who contributed to the household charge. And remind those who didn't contribute to it um, that uh, they, um, they will be required uh, to meet the household charge uh, and half of the property tax next year because it's unfair uh, on those who can quite uh, easily pay, uh, some of them in this house here who haven't bothered to do so. Uh, the mechanics of this have been organised by, uh, by the revenue commissioners. Uh, there will be ample opportunity in a variety of ways to pe for people to contribute to the property tax and those who qualify under the conditions for deferral will have that, um, will have that available to them also. I um, might say, Cancola, uh, we assume the presidency of the Union on the 1st of January. There are 1,600 meetings to be conducted across the whole of government um, for, for all ministers dealing with the European Parliament sectoral uh, things and so on. Um, this country won't, this country won't, won't have sorry, the presidency. Sorry, won't have the presidency again, uh, I think, until 2024, 2026. Um, and in that sense, we, we have to move on here. And um, uh, this was explained to the Whips at the last meeting. So regretfully in this occasion, I can't call uh, I want to move on and, and uh, complete this bill through all stages and deal with it. I now put the question. The question is that the proposal for dealing with item number 26, committee and remaining stages of the finance local property tax bill 2012 be agreed to. Vote. <laughs>
Thank you. Would you please take your seats? Thank you. Proposal number four by Antisha. Sorry. Sorry. Proposal number four by Antisha in the order of business. The question is that the proposal for dealing with item number 26, committee and remaining stages of the Finance Local Property Tax Bill 2012, be agreed to. And on that question, a division has been challenged. Tellers Thaw, Deputies Paul Kyo and Emmett Stagg. Tellers Neil, Deputies Sean O'Freel, are the same as us. Uh, Thaw 84, Neil 46. Uh, the proposal is agreed to. Uh, we have. Um, sorry. We've just uh, five minutes left for the order of business, so uh, I can't take too many people because I'm not going to eat into the time available for the bill we've just. Just uh, sorry, Deputy Furley. I'll, 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 I'll be very brief. Just in terms of the government's decision on the ABC well, expert group uh, option, can I ask the Taoiseach two questions? When might, might we expect to see the legislation and the regulations that you promise uh, published? And um, in terms of uh, the content of that legislation, will it be addressing the issue of suicide as well? Um, the, the, the uh, government decided today to um, uh, choose option uh, D as set out by the expert group, which is to do with legislation and regulation. The um, process will, uh, will involve information hearings by the Arathas Committee on Health. I think it's the 7th, 8th and 9th, or 8th, 9th and 10th of January. Um, after that, uh, the heads of uh, a bill will be prepared and sent to the Arachthus Committee for discussion. When the Arachthus Committee conclude their discussions on that and comes back here, the details of the regulations that would be, will, would be required will be published simultaneously with the legislation so that everybody will have the 
fullest information uh, about all of the issues involved. This matter uh, is to deal with the uh, clarification of the Constitution and therefore the law by the Supreme Court in the X case. And therefore it does include uh, the question uh, of uh, uh, the question of suicide arising from the X case in cases where there is a threat to the life as distinct from the health of the mother. And that's why Deputy O'Farrell um, want everybody in the House uh, to be able to contribute to this, um, to put in place um, legal certainty and regulation in an area that is unregulated. No intention here of um, this being seen as some sort of uh, abortion on demand or abortion replacing uh, contraception. So when you ask me when is the legislation going to be published, it will be prepared after the uh, information hearings at the Committee on Health. We'll go to the Oireachtas Committee for discussion of those heads. will only be uh, published in conjunction with the regulations which will become effective once the, once the bill is put through the House. And I want everybody to be able to contribute to that uh, in a mature, um, sensitive uh, and as comprehensive a fashion as possible. Deputy Adams. Well, I welcome the, the Taoiseach's uh, statement and the announcement that the government will legislate for the next case in, in the new year. Uh, just bearing in mind the conversation we've had earlier on this afternoon, I think it would have been appropriate had you made that announcement uh, in, in here. But, uh, and I know it's a difficult issue for people to deal with, but not least the women of this state and of this uh, Island. Uh, I could also ask if I would, if you would make time, probably now in the new year, for the Dáil to debate the De Silva report in the Pat Panukin case. And particularly, you will recall I wrote to you and asked you if you would uh, review all correspondence uh, in the Taoiseach's department, particularly under the tenure of uh, the late Charlie Hawley, about uh, information which may have been put. Uh, into the Taoiseach's department by the late Paddy McGrory uh, a month before uh, Pat Finucane was killed and immediately afterwards. But I, I specifically would like to ask that we have the opportunity to debate in some detail uh, the De Silva report. Yes, I think this is an important report, Deputy Adams. Uh, I spoke to Prime Minister Cameron and to Geraldine Finucane last week on the publication of the De Silva report. Uh, I have already asked the whip that at the appropriate time in the, when the doll returns in the new year that we make time available for a discussion on the uh, De Silva report. I have received your letter. Uh, I will give that consideration and reply to you properly. Um, we have uh, 20 seconds. Uh, Deputy Finian McGrath. Uh, can, uh, can I ask the Taoiseach in relation to the housing bill which deals with the regulatory framework for housing? Uh, is the Taoiseach aware that last night the residents of Priory Hall stood in the cold and rain and this is their second Christmas that, 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 that they have no homes and the families are ex 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 suffering extreme hardship and can I ask the Taoiseach to urge the Minister of the Environment and people directly involved in the mediation process to get on with the job and support those families? Yes, this is a, a legacy issue here um, of, uh, of um, great concern to the people involved. Um, the Minister uh, is awaiting, I think, a response from the, um, from the judge in this case and obviously can't interfere with that process, Deputy McGrath. Um, there has been some progress on this and um, if we could get those pieces in place it might speed things up. I, I might say, well, I'm on my feet for your information that the Minister is also now in discussion with the uh, Minister for Finance uh, about a substantial loan from lending institutions to deal with the question of pirate, uh, which is also a, a legacy issue that has caused uh, a lot of angst for, for uh, people who bought houses and found them literally cracking up uh, subsequently. That's a matter that now the discussion between finance and the Department of the Environment with a view to that being rectified in 2013, I think that should be good news for those people. That concludes the order of business for today. We have, the time has expired. Um,
Motion re proposed approval by Dáil Éireann of the Horse and Greyhound Racing Fund Regulation 2012. I call on the Minister of State at the Department of the Taoiseach, Deputy Paul Clo, to move the motion. I move. Um, is that agreed? Agreed. Uh, the next uh, motion is uh, the Finance Local Property Tax Bill 2012 Financial Resolution. I call on Minister Howland to move. Move. Does the motion be agreed to? Is that agreed? Agreed. A uh, message from Shanna Dairn. Shanna Dairn has passed the Health and Social Care Professionals Amendment Bill 2012 without amendment and the Europol Bill 2012 without amendment. Uh, we now move on to uh, topical issues. Um, I call on Deputy uh, Charles Flanagan um, to the Minister for Children and Youth Affairs the, near, the need to address the high costs associated with the inter-country adoption of children. Young Carl, I'm before pleased to have the opportunity before the end of term to raise this issue, and I wish to thank the Minister for Children for her attendance. Uh, I'm, I'm somewhat concerned at both the cost and the delay involved in the assessment uh, for those involved in inter-country adoption. Uh, I recognise the need to have the most rigorous of procedures in place insofar as vetting is concerned, uh, home studies, HSE approval, approval of the adoption authority, the suitability of the applicants, and those wishing to provide home and shelter for underprivileged children uh, on a long-term permanent basis. Uh, however, however, that notwithstanding, there are a number of issues that require to be addressed. Uh, I refer particularly to the situation as far as the, the uh, inter-country adoption with the Bulgarian state is concerned. Uh, those uh, parents uh, who are, uh, uh, prospective parents who have completed uh, the legal documentation, who have completed the home study, who have signed up uh, but uh, find themselves in a somewhat precarious situation uh, consequent on the uh, completion of the Hague Convention. Uh, there are those who signed an agreement uh, clearly setting out a payment and cost schedule which has now changed because the state uh, has delegated certain functions uh, to private companies. Uh, and I am anxious that the state satisfy itself as to the financial uh, affairs of these private agencies or companies. Uh, and I'm asking what's the situation regarding uh, the guarantee of funds, uh, the bonding, having regard to the fact that uh, money for services uh, are required to be paid uh, in full upfront, which is somewhat unusual, having regard to the provision of services, uh, either in the private uh, or public sector. Uh, I'm concerned about the duplication in respect of uh, the pre-Hague assessments. Uh, the fact that my understanding is that 3,700 euro is required for what is a 11 hour social work, uh, pre-referral, uh, that's a, that's a, a sizable sum uh, and I'm anxious uh, to be assured that, that, that uh, it's considered in order uh, by the authority. Uh, I need assurance that, that uh, private agencies or private companies don't have the power to refuse a referral, uh, but that power is vested in the adoption authority. I'm concerned at the length of time the has a in which, a, declar in which a, a declaration remains valid. Uh, and I'm, I'm most concerned, as the Minister is aware, uh, by dint of correspondence earlier in the year, I'm most concerned as to the, uh, as to the fee schedule involved, professional fees, transition fees, overheads, direct costs. Uh, I understand from the Adoption Authority uh, that the authorities' accountants are examining these schedules. Uh, that's going on for some time. The reason I raised this in the House is because of unsatisfactory replies to correspondence that I have raised as far back as early summer. So I, I'm, I, I'm pleased the Minister is here uh, and I'm anxious that this, that this issue be addressed and that we have full, full accountability and full transparency and that the costs involved remain reasonable.
Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Deputy Flanagan, for raising this issue, and I appreciate uh, the reasons you know, why you have put this uh, down for discussion today. And I do want to assure you uh, that it is an issue which I am addressing. The Hague Convention and Adoption Act 2010 is designed to provide a framework to assure that all adoptions are effected in the best interest of the child and to the highest possible standard, as you know. And the interests of the child must always be paramount throughout the adoption process. And this is best achieved through the full implementation of the highest national and international standards uh, governing uh, adoption practice. And the Hague Convention does set a, a set of minimum standards which are designed to ensure that good practice uh, based on the principles of subsidiarity, consent and no money changing hands. Uh, Inter-country adoption is not without risk, and it is for this reason that the principles that set out in the Hague Convention were developed. Currently, the costs related to inter-country adoption have mainly been charged by agencies, both state and private, in the sending country. The Adoption Act 2010 envisages a model that incorporates the uses of accredited agencies in both the sending and the receiving country. Uh, however, in some instances, it may be the same agency uh, in both countries. Uh, the AI, as you know, has accredited three agencies at present for the purposes of inter-country adoption, and they're going to be operating in a range of countries. I do want to say, with the, with the signing of the Hague Convention, uh, that the situation has changed uh, very dramatically, and uh, the whole transition issues are, are extremely difficult, particularly for prospective adopters in this country, um, because uh, we do have uh, written into the legislation um, that we can't do co business effectively, we can't have inter-country adoption with countries uh, that haven't uh, assigned the uh, Hague Convention unless we have a bilateral with them or an administrative agreement. And there are huge difficulties involved in many of the countries uh, where uh, we're trying to develop those bilaterals and administrative arrangements. There's even constitutional issues. Um, but, you know, I am addressing them and trying to, to deal with this very sudden, I mean, it is effectively a very sudden transition uh, following the signing of the Hague Convention. I'm advised we're one of the few countries that wrote that into our adoption legislation. So it has made for considerable difficulties. Um, I've recently stated in response to parliamentary questions on re issues related to the level of fees uh, that I'm aware that a number of prospective adoptive parents, some of whom I've met recently, have been asked to pay substantial fees to an accredited body within a short uh, time frame. I did meet with these um, potential adoptive parents uh, uh, some weeks ago. I have discuss discussed the issues with them that you raised, Deputy. I have also asked the Adoption Authority of Ireland to examine them and to take action, because uh, the whole question of the schedule of fees uh, and whether they need to be paid up front as opposed to in a more, you know, um, in a slower way over a period of time, I think does need to be addressed. And I have asked the AI uh, to address that with the adoption body concerned. The AI, with the assistance of their auditors, is examining a number of issues in relation to accredited bodies, including an examination of the level of fees being charged by agent, Irish agencies in relation to international uh, norms. And they will be asked to report back on those proposed schedules as well. Um, I'm very aware that there's a number of uh, couples who've been caught, if you like, in a, a transition phase, um, who had already paid money, for example, in Bulgaria, and who are now being asked uh, to pay uh, here as well. And I have asked the AI to particularly examine the position of those couples to see if some arrangement can be made uh, to facilitate uh, these couples, because they did undertake the adoption process and enter into it in the expectation of certain costs, uh, which they did not believe would go as high as they have done. And, and I do think that that's a very difficult situation for them. So I will examine that uh, particularly. Minister, your time is... Okay. Uh, very briefly, Two here, look, I, I'm, indeed, I'm very pleased with what the Minister has said about uh, auditors having a look at the fee schedule. But just very briefly, by way of supplementary question, uh, if I can ask the Minister if, if the State ha has satisfied itself um, as to the financial standing uh, of the, the agencies uh, or bodies involved in the process. Uh, and secondly, uh, our, our prospective parents, uh, those who have been in the system pre Hague, uh, are they legally obliged? to deal now with the designated authority, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the process has already long since commenced. Uh, the answer to the last question is yes. 
um, they are expected to deal with the agency here in Ireland. But as I say, I think we can look at the, if you like, the, the terms and conditions uh, into which they are entering uh, the arrangement and see if we can facilitate them more than they have been to date. Uh, the second point is that the whole question of, uh, given the slowness in inter-country adoption at the moment, the whole question of the sustainability of the accredited bodies is one that I'm very conscious of. And um, the AI, I've asked the AI to uh, be in close touch with the agencies in relation to uh, the monitoring of the current situation and looking at the sustainability issues over the next uh, uh, couple of months and, and years as well, because it's very important that we have these bodies and the whole question of their financing. Um, is a difficult one, given, if you like, the, the delays in inter-country adoption, because uh, these agencies, there is a, a fairly complex relationship between you know, the number of adopters going forward and the fees and the sustainability of the agencies. So, uh, as I say, this is an issue that's very much on the agenda. I've had re meetings in relation to it very recently, and I have asked the AI to examine it most seriously and to come back to me with a full report. Thank you, Minister. Thank you, Deputy. Uh, the next deputy is uh, Deputy Niall Collins. Uh, two minutes, or four minutes, and did the Minister of Justice and Equality file attempt by the Continuity IRA to murder a British soldier in Limerick? Sorry, the Minister. Um, Arriving. Thanks, um, thanks, Gion Corla, and I'd like to thank Gion Corla for um, selecting this item today for mentioning Dáil Éireann, which is a hugely uh, both topical and important item which was uh, broken on the news this morning by Barry Duggan and Tom Brady of the Irish Independent newspaper. And I, I regret, Minister, that we're back here again today having to discuss uh, another uh, unseemly event connected to gangland criminality uh, and on this occasion in Limerick. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate the members of Ungarda Siakana in Limerick for filing this planned uh, murder attempt on a, a citizen of Ireland, a citizen of Limerick, and a person who happens to be pursuing a career in the British Defence Forces. And I think it's important to point out that this is against the backdrop of some very um, good police work in the Limerick area over the last number of years. where.